Welcome to the service of worship. Today is the Lord's Day. It is the, the day on which Jesus rose from the dead and we just celebrate that as Christians through the centuries. And so we serve a risen Saviour today. We come before him and we bring our praise and our adoration. Welcome to the service. May you be blessed in it. And so, Father, we come into your presence today and we have sung about our eyes seeing the glory of the coming of the Lord. We have sung about the things that you have done and we are so grateful for that. We come and we worship the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We bring praise and glory and honour to your name and we thank you, Lord, that even as we come today, we can have the assurance that you have been faithful in the past and therefore we will see your faithfulness in the future because you are an unchanging God and we worship you, we praise you, we glorify you and we thank you for your generosity to us. We thank you, Lord, for your provision for us. We thank you for the grace that you have poured out upon us and for your patience with us because so often we go and we do our own thing. We sin. Sometimes we don't do the things that we should and we sin. And we need cleansing and forgiveness for that sin before we can come into your presence. And we thank you that Jesus shed his blood on the cross so that today we can confess our sin and know that you are faithful and just and will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, restore that relationship of fellowship that is so important to us and which is your plan for each one of us. We ask, Lord, that during this time of worship, you will come and you will, you will speak to our hearts, you will open our minds and our understanding that your word would come alive that we would be challenged and would have the courage to implement the things that you tell us. And so, Lord Jesus, we worship you. We give you thanks, praise, glory and honour. We thank you that on a day when the disciples didn't know how to pray, they came to you and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And you said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture's reading this morning comes from Matthew 28, the last chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to read it together. And may God speak to your heart even as we read it and interpret its meaning to our understanding. It's headed, Jesus has risen. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And the gods were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then going quickly to tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And while the women were on their way, some of the gods went into the city and reported to the chief priests 
everything that had happened. And when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. And so the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is God's word to us today. May he bless it to us. Johann Sebastian Bach had 20 children, seven by his first wife, Maria, and four of them survived to adulthood. And when she died, Bach only heard about it two months later. He was on a concert tour or, or something, and he heard only two months later that his wife had died. And he remarried, and he married Anna, and Anna and he had 13 children. Six survived to adulthood. So of the 20, 10 made it to adulthood. One of the births of Maria was twins. So there were only 19 confinements. He took Genesis 9 verse 7 very seriously. Go forth and multiply. <laughs> Dawson Trotman founder of the Navigators, wrote a booklet called Born to Reproduce. And Trotman's driving principle was based on the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Just to remind you what it is, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And Trotman said that evangelism is like having children. A couple does not have children for only a few reasons. Maybe they cannot have children if they are immature. They have not reached physical maturity in every way. And they're unable to have children. They also cannot reproduce unless they have a relationship that will result in a child being born. The third reason is they cannot reproduce if there is a physical or a medical reason, a health issue. And so he puts forward maturity, relationship, and, and health as the requirements for reproduction. And he relates that to our spiritual life. We do not reproduce spiritually if we are spiritually immature, if we do not have a relationship with God, and if we are not spiritually healthy. Now, Trotman's conclusion was that if you are born again of the Spirit of God, and those are my words to describe the experience that he was referring to, and you are spiritually mature, then you have no spiritual health issues that are going to prevent you, then it is natural for you to be reproducing spiritually, just as couples physically, it is natural for them to have children if those other issues are not a problem. And so you should be reproducing spiritually as you lead people into faith and help them to find Jesus. And the reality is that most of us are not. And we are not doing it 
because we are not engaging in activity that will result in the spiritual rebirth for those around us. It should be the most natural thing that we do. And many of us made a special effort when we had well. Remember well? The week of witness? And you used some of the opportunities we suggested and made a special effort to witness to other people. Now, I have no intention of sending you on a guilt trip today. But I must ask the question of how seriously you take the Great Commission. Johann Sebastian Bach excelled in bringing forth sons and daughters, but we failed dismally in leading people to new life in Christ. We need to take care that we do not go over the top. The conquistadores and the crusaders both confronted people with the option of being baptized or to be killed. Jews in Europe were baptized without having faith. The indigenous people in South America, most notably, were baptized to stay alive. And the sad thing is that being baptized does not make anybody a Christian. But because church and government were tied together so tightly, those territories that were colonized became Catholic without real faith and belief amongst the people. And they became Catholic, but that didn't really make them Christian. It produced in the main members and not disciples. And the Great Commission tells us that we must make disciples. They were baptizing without discipleship, without discipling. And so where does that put us? The commission stands. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the world. Jesus gives another instruction in Acts chapter 1. He says, he says, Go and wait in Jerusalem, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 and 8. A week later, 3,000 people, according to the scripture record, committed their lives to Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. Acts tells us that God added daily to their number those who were being saved. Why? It wasn't with the force of the conquistadores or the crusaders. It wasn't at the point of a sword. It was the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of the believers. In Acts chapter 4, we read that a further 5,000 were added to the number when the lame man was healed. And it tells us there, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, with great power, and great grace was upon them all. After the experience of Ananias and Sapphira, where they lied to the Holy Spirit and they died, it tells us that great fear was in the hearts of the people. And that was replaced by great joy. And so we have these four elements. The power, which is balanced by grace. Fear, which, is balanced, which develops into joy. And that's how our witness should be. I don't see any great offense. I don't see any great violence. I don't see any great pressure. But we cannot write the Great Commission off. We cannot sit back and take comfort. We cannot brush it aside. We cannot say it doesn't apply. It was for the apostolic age. It doesn't apply. And you know what? Jesus gave that instruction 
that day to some very imperfect men and women. And nothing has changed. You and I may feel that we are inadequate for the task. We may feel that we cannot speak to anybody else. We're too shy. But there is boldness there, and there is grace there, and there is joy there to overcome our fear. And nothing has changed. And so we need to go. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we have such a life-changing message and a life-changing mission to go into this world. And the world is desperate for the message that we have. And yet we are reticent to go. We are reticent to share. We are embarrassed to talk to people about Jesus. And yet it is so easy when we put our minds to it, when we when during wow some of us really really tried hard took great effort and people responded and so we come today lord and we say we hear your instruction we hear that we need to go we hear that we need to make disciples and we know that we go forth in the power of the holy spirit and that he will convict, and that he will bring people to you, and that he will give fruit to our witness. And we thank you for that. Find us faithful, I pray, in witnessing. And we ask that in your name. Amen. Let's bless each other as we say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Go well, go in joy, go in peace and go with the enthusiasm to just share your love, your life with others as you tell of Jesus. Goodbye.